Good to see everybody. What about page, I think it's 167 in the old red Hennemoral, Hemanoral? Uh, and if we're blessed, look at that. Well, they're still going down there. That may be an intro, I'm not sure. How about standing and singing with us? Joy unspeakable. The calf has never yet been sold. Ready? I have found his grace is all complete. He supplied every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable, full of glory. offering which goes to uh, to my uh, cousin-in-law. I don't know how far down a cousin he is. But anyhow, his daddy was a first cousin, so he must be second, huh? And his family, thank God, uh, going into the mission work, and we appreciate them. As I said, Terry and Karen, uh, these, these children were raised in Africa, thank God. Uh, uh, Terry and Karen went there some 40-some years ago, and, and God use their ministry praise god they got to do a, a variety of things as kids karen was a nurse she uh, worked at the hospital terry did construction his daddy was a builder he did construction work there went on to teach at the college to do one thing after the other wound up as field director of about six or seven countries in africa anyhow a wonderful wonderful work uh came home uh, a few years, probably three or four years ago, and thought they would retire, but there's no re retirement here. They went on to work, thank God, for, for the ministry and, and helping the, uh, those that had retired from missionary work and still today do a great work, and we're proud of, of Brent and Destiny and their beautiful family, and, uh, and I think Robbie, I think I saw him come in anyhow, you know, from what I see. God bless him. Praise God. Listen, I couldn't be more proud of all the folks that, that uh, is in our family, 
I couldn't be any more proud, I'm telling you, than, than them. We're the most blessed people, my friend. Best. We, God just poured it out on us, and so I'm thankful for that. And so as the ushers come, we're going to sing this old song, Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. Pray for us, Henry. How about coming up and trying one for us? We'll, we'll get behind you. We'll help you. No, we're not taking an offering for them, but we'll, we'll help them. You love these guys? We love these boys. Proud of them. Talented. They use it for the Lord. Try A. If it's not, we'll change it. Somebody's praying. I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can see, Lord, I believe, Lord, I believe somebody's praying for me, angels are watching. 
watching I can feel it Angels are watching over me There's many miles ahead Till I get home Still I'm safely kept Before your throne Lord I believe Lord I believe Angels are watching over me Well I've walked through barren wilderness when my pillow was a stone And I've been through the darkest caverns Where no light had ever shone Still I went on Cause there was someone Down on their knees And Lord I thank you for all those people Praying all this time for me Somebody's praying I can feel it Somebody's praying for me Mighty hands are guiding me To protect me from What I can see Lord, I believe Lord, I believe somebody's praying for me. Can you do that? I can be hard without my sister. I don't think I've ever done it without my sister. So. Of the Lord, 
I'm restored and made right He got hold of my life I've got Jesus I could have won more I'm restored and made right He got hold of my life I've got Jesus I could have won more I've got Jesus How could I want more? Smooth, isn't it? Yeah. I think him and the sister and brother could go on their own and leave dad at home. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Love them, man. That's good stuff. Amen. Well, as Ron said, we're, we're privileged to have uh, Brent and his family here, our family here, and uh, we, we love and appreciate them, and they're going to come and share the work. I want you to make them welcome and pray for them, so we'll turn the service over to them. Come on, buddy. All right, here, let's, let's get out around here so we can be seen. Very good, all right. Well, thank you guys so much for welcoming us. Uh, we are the Duncans, um, and in just a second, we're, we're going to speak a little bit more about what God is doing, but I want uh, my kids to introduce themselves, so we're going to start with this little guy. Can you tell them? Jumbo or Fakey, that means hello, friend. I'm Elijah. I'm four years old. Um, I'm going to go to Africa. I'm going to, I'm going to go in a new school, and it's going to be RVA, and it's going to be so much fun. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gracie. I am 10 years old, and when we move to RVA, I will be in fifth grade. One of my favorite songs from when we went to Africa was um, Cast Your Burdens. And if everybody will please stand we want, and help us sing this song. Yeah. All right, we're, uh, this is Cast Your Burdens. Um, yes, Cast Your Burdens Unto Jesus. We've never done this before, so you guys are our guinea pigs. But we also know that you guys love singing, amen? All right. So we're going to sing it, and we're going to sing it the way we sing it in Kenya, all right? Uh, it's very easy. Cast your burdens unto Jesus, for he cares for you. Higher, 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 and then lower, lower. And I want you to do uh, the actions with us. Are you, all right? So this is, your, uh, this, is your, this is your exercise for today. Are you, are you ready? All right. Go ahead, honey. All right. Cast your, your burdens, burdens unto Jesus. Jesus. For cares for you, cast your burdens. You can join us. Onto Jesus. For cares for you, higher, 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 higher. Lift up Jesus higher. Lower, 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 Satan, lower. All right, let's do it again. Cast your burdens. Unto Jesus, He cares for you. Cast your burdens onto Jesus, He cares for you. Higher, 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 higher. Lift up Jesus higher. Lower, 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 Satan, lower. Amen. Thank you, guys. That was amazing. We, we are the Duncans, and uh, I'm sure you're excited to hear one more Duncan on your stage. Um, we're, we're related, Ron, sorry. Uh, I, I've been trying to figure this out. But I believe that your grandfather, Duncan side, is that Worthy and Ella, is that correct? Yeah, we call him Earn. Earn, okay. 
All right. Well, he would be our grand, that would be my grandparents, great grandparents. It would be the same as Hoy and, and Will. So uh, Will and Hoy and, and all of us share uh, the same great grandparents, which to me uh, is such a blessing. Uh, there's a lot of family uh, in this room, and, and it means a whole lot to me, even though I've spent very little of my life uh, in this part of the United States, or even with uh, distant cousins and, and uncles, if you will. Uh, it's meant a lot. And to be honest with you, I'm a little emotional tonight. Um, you, you, not all of you may know Terry and Karen Duncan. My mom is over here. Uh, but uh, the last time, and once I get through this, we're good to go. But the last time, uh, my dad was excited about us speaking here. Uh, he, he was excited to, to talk to Will uh, and see uh, with getting us on the schedule. Um, and the last time I heard that my dad speak was he got me on the phone and he said, I got you. I got you an appointment. It's the last time I heard my dad speak. And so I'm grateful to be here. And, uh, all right. Jesus is good. Uh, we have we have great people, um, great great grandparents and grandparents, and it's neat to see uh, Hoy, you in the ministry, and your yes. and uh, your cousin in the ministry. My brother is sitting over here. Um, he's in the ministry as a, a children's director over in Coco. Uh, my sisters are uh, doing ministry in California, and the other. Uh, and we're we're all over the world, and we're at Will's in in Israel, and. Uh, Australia, uh, my sister's in Australia, and it's just neat, and it shows, um, it's a testimony to me of the diligence of, of godly mothers and fathers raising their children, um, and, and we are um, beneficiaries of that, and we also want to obviously pass that on uh, to our kids, and, and so it's just neat, and so it's a pleasure truly to be with you this evening, and um, my name is Brent Duncan, and just a little bit, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, um, but I'm going to let my wife speak. This is, this is my wife, Destiny. Um, you can just tell her a little, just where you're from, okay. uh, kind of where you're from, and then we'll go. Well, first, I wanted to say that these young men back here were impressive, and I would talk about being families carrying it on. I said to Brent, their parents have to be so Absolutely. proud. Because if my son gets up and sings like that at your age, I'm going to say, praise the Lord for that. So thank you for doing that. That was amazing. Um, you don't meet very many teenagers that would be willing to do that. So um, I'm actually from um, Parkersburg, West Virginia. Um, that's where I was born and raised. And um, I met Brent, and he'll tell you that in a little bit, how that came together. Um, and I got invited into the Duncan family. So I guess I'm a Duncan. I don't know who my relatives are in this room, but nice to meet you if I haven't yet. <laughs> when I met this family, I'm like, who is really a relative and who is really just an aunt that we call an aunt and uncle? Because I feel like I'm meeting them all over the place. Thank you for having us so much. All right. Well, we are, um, you know a lot about me, which is kind of scary. Uh, <laughs> but for those of you who don't, allow me to, to share. Uh, my parents did work in Kenya for 37 years. That number keeps growing, Ron. I, every time you 40, 45, yeah, 36 years. Um, and during that time, uh, it was an amazing opportunity. I would never change uh, growing up uh, in Kenya. Uh, but while I was there, um, there are different challenges, if you will, that, that uh, missionaries take. And one of the main challenges that uh, missionaries have um, is taking care of their kids. Where, where are they going to go to school? And uh, when I, when growing up, uh, I started off in a local school uh, in Caricho, the little town that my parents were ministering uh, at the time at the little college. Um, and so I went to a local school. I was the only white kid in a, in a, in a room of Kenyan uh, kids. And it was a really interesting environment for me to be in. Um, but I loved it. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, but it came time for my parents to come back to the United States for deputation, to raise support, to go back. And we usually came back for a year, and so they put us into the local schools. Um, and so that was in Vienna, West Virginia, where Destiny's from. Um, and so I went to the local school, and, and they wanted to make sure I was in the right place. So they uh, tested me on a few things, reading, writing, and those. And uh, they noticed that my scores were, were pretty low. And so they were a little concerned, and that was, in, that was at my second grade year. And so they said, you know, we probably ought to put you back into second grade. Um, and, and let you redo it 
Um, that way, I, I think that they, he should be on the same level um, as the rest of his peers. And so I redid second grade. And that way, when I went back to Kenya, my parents were still a little concerned. They didn't know if they should put me back in that particular school because that was, that was close to home, right? That was in the same hometown. Um, and at that time, they had already sent my brother, he's two years older than me, uh, to the local boarding school, uh, Rift Valley Academy. Um, and so my parents rethought. They're like, well, Robbie's already there. Maybe we should, maybe we should also send Brent. Um, and so they did. And so I went to boarding school at third grade. So I want you to put yourself in my parents' shoes. Um, if you have a, a third grader in your midst, uh, can you imagine sending your, your third grader uh, off to school at this point, their second son? Um, and if you asked her uh, afterwards, if you asked her if that was an easy thing to do, I know for sure that she will say no. It was one of the hardest decisions that uh, my parents ever had to, made, but they also, uh, to make, but they also recognized that it was one of the most necessary things uh, for them to do. Uh, why is that important? Because they wanted us to grow, uh, to, to learn. Uh, they wanted us to grow in, in, in our educational, socially. There are so many different things that are important about the schooling in which your children go to. And so I went off to RVA at the third grade. And it was in third grade that my teacher during that time uh, pulled me aside uh, after class, she said, Brent, and then I, there was another friend of mine there. He said, why don't you stay after class with me? I wasn't in trouble. Uh, I know that's what you're thinking. Uh, but I wasn't in trouble. She, and, and she pulled me aside, and later on she said, uh, have you ever asked Jesus into your heart? And remember, I, I, this, I come from a missionary home, right? You know, I, I went to church. I went to every prayer meeting. I went to everything that was Christian at the time. Uh, but at that point in my life, I'd never... Ask Jesus into my heart. And I thought that that's a neat thing. And I know that a part of uh, this church, you have Sefner uh, Christian School. And what an opportunity that teachers have the ability to pull a child aside after school and say, hey, have you ever asked Jesus into your heart? And Rift Valley Academy is a Christian school uh, that, uh, that ministers to missionary kids that need Jesus. Amen? Amen. Have you ever thought that missionary kids need Jesus? She pulled me aside and she asked me that question and I said, no, I've never asked it. And she began to talk to me about Jesus. I'd heard the name before many times, um, but she really spoke to my heart. And I really felt at that point that I wanted to ask Jesus into my heart. And so in third grade, uh, in a remote school in the middle of Africa, I asked Jesus into my heart. And I believe that from that moment, Jesus entered my heart and he's been changing me and he's been molding me into the man that I am today that I hope is pleasing to God. And, uh, in the midst of that, um, there were challenges as, as I grew older. I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but the Holy Spirit has been good to me um, and, and, and uh, bringing me along. And I've had a lot of great mentors and godly parents to, to give me um, uh, the way in which uh, to walk. And they gave me the word of God, um, which I'm so grateful for. Uh, but RVA was significant to me. Um, nine, nine months out of the year, the same as you would have here but it was broken up over three periods of time. So you went to school for nine months, and you were off a month. You went to, I'm sorry. You went to school three months, then you were off a month, three months, off a month. So you still get nine months of school, but it's broken up throughout the entire year. And that way you're able to go home for a little bit, and you're not gone from your parents for a full nine months. But it really transformed my life. In many ways, I was raised at this school from grade three all the way to the time that I graduated. I graduated from... Uh, from high school, from Rift Valley Academy, I went to uh, Asbury College in Kentucky. I studied there for four years. And in which that time, I, I really asked the question, Jesus, what is it that you want to do with me? You know, that's, that's what an amazing question, but it was, it's such a big thing. And, and I wrestled that with that. I really did. What is it that, God, you want me to do? I come from this amazing background of missions yeah. in Africa, and my heart really longed to go back, but is it because I just wanted to go home, because it's what I knew, it's what I was comfortable with, or was it really because God was calling me into that? And so I, I, I wrestled for my whole senior year, and I had already, uh, in my mind, I would said, I, I want to I devote myself to ministry, and so that's what I promised God. I said, Jesus, if you, if you call me to Africa, it's not because that it's, quote unquote, my home, but it's because you've called me there to reach the unreached people for Christ, Amen. And so I've, I've held that within my heart. Um, and so after college, I graduated with a degree in Christian ministries uh, with an emphasis in missions. I went back. I worked uh, with WGM, uh, the organization my parents worked with. 
Um, I, I did my master's uh, in Kenya, in Nairobi, the capital city, because I desired to live and learn amongst uh, the church leaders in Africa. If I was going to minister to them, then I wanted to hear how they viewed God. Like, what, what did they, when they read scripture, you know, based in their culture, how do they see God? And how, is he, how does he minister to them in, in, in the ways that they see it? And so I was learning. I was studying beside of them. Uh, it was a really neat thing because oftentimes as a missionary, when you go into these areas, you're put on a platform that you really don't deserve. But because you're a missionary, you're supposed to be more spiritual than they are, which isn't true. They're very, very spiritual people. They know Jesus. But it put us on this even kind of keel. You know, I, I studied with you. I learned on the same professor as you did. And it was just a really neat opportunity to develop those relationships with future church leaders in Africa. And so I did my seminary degree there. I did my master's uh, in missions with an emphasis in Islamic studies. And so with that, um, after that time, I was still kind of wrestling. All right, Jesus, where is it that you want me to go? What is it you want me to do? Um, and I, got, uh, I was able to work with Samaritan's Purse at the time, and I traveled throughout South Sudan working with uh, Operation Christmas Child. I don't know if you're familiar with Operation Christmas Child with uh, Samaritan's Purse. I, I worked there. I also worked in Uganda and all, o- all over East Africa because that's where my heart was at. Um, but there, I, I was this bachelor just running around Africa telling people about Jesus in, in many different ways, right? But there was something that was missing. And after a while, I kind of was like, all right. I mean, I, I love this, and I love where I'm at, and I love these people, uh, but there's something that's missing. And at that point in time, I said, I need, I need a partner. So I said, all right, I'm going to go back to the States. Uh, and so that's what I did. I came back to the United States, went to uh, West Virginia, which was home to me, and my parents uh, have an apartment that, there. And so I moved into the apartment. Um, Tiana, uh, one of my uh, twin sisters, was living there at the time. I just got a job, and I moved in. And I didn't really have a particular plan other than I was just going to move in, all right, and just kind of figure things out from there. And uh, lo and behold, uh, the apartment next to us uh, became vacant. And because my parents at the time were in Kenya, I was the acting landlord. And so I could kind of pick and choose who uh, the tenants were that came into the apartment. And uh, after some time, uh, somebody showed up. And I thought, oh. She, she, she has a job, you know, everything, everything looks good, you know, for, for any tenant to come in. And uh, so uh, my wife uh, today, Destiny, uh, had moved in next door. And so uh, we became friends, and after some time, obviously, uh, we got married. And so that's kind of my story leading up to the time that I met Destiny. And uh, she, her story is a little bit different, but um, I think it'll be interesting to you how Jesus kind of brings things together. Okay, so my story is actually a lot different than Brent's, um, and I hope that in some way you can relate to me. Um, So I grew up in Parkersburg, West Virginia, as I had said, and I had gone to church my whole life. Um, My parents took me to every service as well, which was a blessing, and I'm thankful for that. I became a Christian in fifth grade um, through the Awana program, which I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but I was involved in that. Um, and my parents, I mean, we did local missions. We um, did things within our church and within the community, but I'd never even, I've never gone on a mission trip. And um, when I met Brent and he said, you know, Des, if we're going to move forward with our relationship, I need to know something. If God calls us to be missionaries, are you willing? And I was like, this is a pretty serious question, and I know how important this is to Brent. So I said, let me pray about it. I wanted to say, yeah, because I wanted to marry Brent. But I knew it was serious. So I went home and I prayed about it. And I came back to him and I said, yeah, I think I, think I could do that. You know, whatever that looks like, you're going to have to explain that to me because I don't know all the details about being a missionary. But if God called us, I'm willing to go. So we got married. And um, we were married for f- five years or so. And um, Brent was being the associate pastor at our church. And I was the children's director. But I noticed something about Brent that was missing. And it was really bothering me. And I kept saying, Brent, what is going on? You know, I can explain my feelings to the T. Why can't you tell me what's different about you? You're missing. There's something lacking. It's a passion for your ministry. Like, you're doing great. Your sermons are awesome. And I know you love the people and sharing God's love. But where's your, the passion that you had, the excitement? And so finally one day he came to me and he said, Des, I think we're being called to Africa. I was like, what? <laughs> um, 
the only way you're going to have passion is if we go to Africa. Like, there's a lot of places in this world. Why does it have to be Africa? And then I remembered, oh, yeah, I told him that I'd be willing to go. But does it have to be now? So I wasn't really happy with Brent. I'm just going to be completely transparent and honest with you guys. And I don't know if you've ever experienced what I experienced next. But I had a lot of time with just me and the Lord. And I cried a lot. And I was not happy. And I kept arguing with the Lord and kept saying, Lord, why our life is good. It's, it's peaceful, and our kids are doing great, and our families wonder, why do we need to go to Africa? What can you do with me in Africa? I'm just a normal girl living through life, you know, as a pastor's wife, and I'm doing the best I can. I don't have a perfect past. I've made mistakes. God's given me grace and pulled me through it. How could you use me to be a missionary? I kept saying, are you sure, Lord? Are you sure it's me? And I felt like the Lord was saying yes, but I didn't want to hear it. And so we sat down with a good friend of mine, and she kind of played as a mentor in between us. She said, okay, Brent, tell me what's on your heart. Okay, Destiny, tell me what's on your heart. And I had like a, a page of 10, 15 questions that I needed answered before I could say I was going to Africa. And she was like, Destiny, I need to tell you some things. She said, you know, I love you, but she said, first of all, God's not going to give you all those answers just because you want them. So all those questions, it's okay to write them down because that's what you do. But God's going to give you those answers when he feels you're ready to have those answers. And it may not even be until you're in Africa. Second of all, do you love your husband? And I said, well, of course I love my husband. Do you trust your husband? Do you trust that he loves the Lord so much and he seeks the Lord's direction? And if God calls him to go to Africa... You need to let him take you to Africa because for some reason, God didn't call us wives to be the leaders of our household, even when we think we could do a better job. He called those husbands to lead our household. And she said, you need to let your husband lead you. And I said, okay, sign me up because <laughs> I needed to hear that. You know, there's just moments where you're just, you're saying, God, are you sure? And he's not going to just, like, send you a note. You know, it's, people have to intervene, and, and she was definitely one of those people. And so then we had to tell my family, and that was really difficult. My family loves Jesus, and they serve in their church. But to tell them that I was moving to Africa, and I see them almost every day, and my kids see them almost every day, was not exciting news to share with them. But what was so important to me was when my mom looked at me, and she said, I'm not happy that you're going to Africa, but I'm proud of you because you love the Lord, and I'm proud of you for allowing him to lead you because I know that that's what you're doing, and she said, and I'm proud of your relationship with the Lord. I'm not happy. I'm, you know, I'm really upset, actually, but I'm proud of you, and so that meant more than anything. In the days that we, you know, we struggle, we have hard moments where she's like, what am I going to do without you? But she's so proud of me, and I know that, and she's very supportive. And even though she doesn't want me to go, she knows I'm going to go. And, and she has confidence in that, and she has faith in that. So, so we went to a training in June in, in, um, with our mission organization. It's called Africa Inland Mission, and um, it's in Peachtree, Georgia. And um, it was for seven days, and it was quite an amazing experience. We walked in the door, and this lady came up, and she said, Are you the Duncans? And I said, Yeah. She said, I've been praying for you. I was like, you've been praying for me. You don't even know me. She said, yeah, I picked your name. I've been praying for you. And I was like, that means so much to me. And throughout the week, we spent so much time in prayer. How many of you guys have ever come back from a retreat or a camp of some sort, and you're just on this Jesus high, like, nobody's going to stop me. You know, I got Jesus. And, and then you got to come back to the real world, and it gets difficult. But you just love Jesus so much, and you just been surrounded by like-minded people. And that's how it was. All these people in this room were doing just what we were doing. They were ready to go out, trust the Lord, and serve the Lord, and share his love with people in Africa. There were people from ages of 21, just out of college, single girls, impressive, single girls, ready to go to that field alone. And older women and people that are married, people with kids, some without kids, some that were pregnant in the room. It was incredible. And so while we were there, we knew that we were being called to serve at Rift Valley Academy, where Brent had gone to boarding school. 
but other people there didn't know where they were going. They just knew they were going to Africa. And so there was a special meeting while you were there, and they would tell you, like, here's the options that fit what, you know, we feel like you're qualified to do. And so I was always excited, like, did you find out where you're going in Africa? And I'd get really excited for them. And then I'd say, because I went into this, this um, training um, thinking that we had signed up for a two-year commitment. So I'm focused. We're going for two years. I'm doing what my husband feels like we're called to do. God's made it clear. He wants me to go for some reason. Okay, so we're here. And I go up to someone, and I'm like, so, hey, did you find out where you're going in Africa? And I'm so excited for them. And, and they're like, yeah, they would tell me. And I'd say, so how, how long are you going for? Well, for as long as God wants me to go. And I was like, okay, I signed up for two years, and you're going for as long as God wants you to go. Well, I'm not going to tell you I only signed up for two years because <laughs> in my mind I'm like, mm-mm. Okay, and then I go up to the next person. I'd be super excited again. Did you find out where you're going to Africa? How long are you going for? This single girl just out of college. I'm going to serve as long as the Lord needs me there. I was like, what is wrong with me? (laughs) I mean, or what's wrong with them? I'm not sure because I'm signed up for two years, and they're just willing to go for how long? Because I I have plans, you know, like, I'm Lord, I'm going to go serve. And then I'm going to come back because I want to finish my master's in counseling. And I want to do all these other things. And my kids need to go to this school. And I was like, man, these people are really kind of putting me in my place and not even realizing it. And so about halfway through the week, I got it. I was missing a lot. I had said, yes, I'll go to Africa. And to be honest, part of me was still saying, I just need to make my husband happy. And now I'm embarrassed to say that I actually said those words to people. I actually said to my friends, I just really need to respect my husband and make him happy and go to Africa. I'm so ashamed because I look back and I think, it's not even about my husband. It's not about me. It's not about my kids. It's not even about my in-laws who served in Africa. It's about the Lord. And so all this time, I just, I didn't have a ride. I was getting closer. You know, I was hearing the Lord and he was pulling me closer. But while we were there, I said, Brent, I need to talk to you. I realized something today. I was just still giving God a crumb of me, and he wants all of me. He wants all of who I am to do whatever he needs to do with me there. And so I said, I'm willing to go for as long as the Lord calls us to go. And if that's two years, that's two years. But if that's longer, that's okay. And, and as I'm struggling with that decision, like, hey, I think God still wants to use us here. God's going to comfort me, and he's not going to forget to comfort my family. You know, and so I had to come back. And Brett was super excited, obviously, with that news. And I had to come back and then take a walk with my mom and say, Mom, I need to tell you something. This, this training was incredible. And I told her all about it. And I said, but something important I need you to hear. I said, when you tell people about us, because she likes to tell everybody because she's proud of us. You know how moms do. Can you not mention that it's just two years? And she said, well, you told me it's just two years. And I said, I know I did. And I'm sorry. I didn't mean to lie to you, but would you rather me do what the Lord asked me to do or do what you want me to do, Mom? You know, the reality is if God wants me there for longer, I need to be willing. And, Mom, he's not going to forget about you when he's comforting me. And I have to reassure her all the time that God's already there. He's already at RVA, and he's got people there to be my friend that's going to get me. He's got someone there that's going to be a mom figure when I need one. He's got grandparents to be grandparent figures to my kids when they need it. You know, he's got it covered. He's already ahead of me. I wanted to read a verse that that just speaks to me so strongly. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I struggle with, with anxiety a lot, and I have a lot right now going on to be anxious for. We leave in three months. We leave July 9th. There's a lot on our plate right now, but I'm reminded about the peace, the peace that God's given me, and I'm excited. I'm excited for what God has planned for us, and when people come to me and they're like, did you just hear about that shooting in Kenya, and in that plane crash in Kenya? Did you just hear about that? And I'm like, okay, I, I know I need to hear it, But usually when I would hear things like that, my mind would just kind of obsess and I would have bad dreams and I just couldn't get out of my head. But not anymore. God has been amazing with the peace that he's given me in my heart. I just take that information and I just set it right over here. I know about it, but I just set it right over here and I keep trucking for straight ahead 
for what the Lord has planned for us because this is where he's taken us. And I just said that information right over here. So what I want to share with you is that this is extremely outside of my comfort zone, as I'm sure you've noticed with my story. But I'm excited and I'm willing. And what I hope in my prayer is that you guys understand that what we're doing in Africa is just as important as what you're doing right here in your own community, in your own church, and in your own grocery stores. God just happened to call us there. But what you're doing, he loves just as much. And so just as he's pulled me out of my comfort zone, he's, you know, he's pushed me, and I've been like, God, me? Guess what? He's saying that to you too. He's saying that when you walk into the grocery store and the lady at the cash register is having a bad day and God's saying, cheer her up. He's saying that to you. And, I, and, you know, like me, I've said, why is it me? Is there somebody else you could send, Lord? I'm okay just being me right here. He's saying that to you, too. Don't wait for that next person to say hi because maybe that lady needs to hear from you. So I just want to encourage you to hear God and to, to seek his guidance. We kept praying, God, wherever you want to take us. But I kept saying, except I want to stay in the States. <laughs> but God told me something different. So I just pray that you can experience that same peace that God's given me in your own life and that you can follow where he directs you. So here we are on this journey. We leave in three months, and this has been quite a journey of ups and downs. You know, the devil attacks where he wants to, and you, you have humps in the road, and we have hard days that I feel completely overwhelmed, and then I have other days where I'm just pushing through and, and feel like I'm able to get so much done. And, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be serving at the school that Brent told you about that he attended, as dorm parents for up to 20 11th grade girls. So we are going to be parents of 11th grade girls. Brent, did you have something to say? Amen. <laughs> what he means to say is pray for me. <laughs> so these girls are under, you know, we're going to be their parents because their parents are gone for nine months out of the year. They're going to be with us. And then our kids will also live with us. Um, and then, like, Gracie is obviously of the age to board, but she'll be living with us. And she'll just be invited to do the things that the other sixth graders do. She'll be in sixth grade there. And Elijah will be in kindergarten. He'll be there half a day. And as a mom, I feel like my role is a little bit different. I, I have so many things that I want to do um, while we're there and experience. But number one, my job title is to be a dorm parent. But number two, I'm trying to learn Swahili because there are ladies in that market that I want them to know that I'm there to be their friend and to love on them. And so I know that most people probably know at least a broken English, but I want to walk up and be able to say, how are you doing today? And realize that I took the time to learn their language because I care. And so my kids and I are trying to learn the language and I want to take my kids and try to get them involved in the community as much as I can and find ways that they can be a part of what we're doing, not just attending school. Um, and our responsibilities as dorm parents are kind of just like what you would be doing as parents. We have to mentor them. We do devotions with them. We do their projects. We go to their special events. We attend church. We love on them, we listen to them. Whatever it is that they need that you can think that your 11th grade girl or someone that you might know would need, that's what we're gonna be doing. And so at first when we found that out, I was like, you want me to be the mom of 20 11th grade girls? I'm just with a fifth grader girl here. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that, but um, you know, I feel like God's given us an awesome opportunity and he'll give us the, what we need to, to help these girls. So anyways, I'll let Brent talk a little bit. Thank you. So that's a little bit of a uh, specifics of as to what we are going to be doing. But I want to kind of back you up. I want to take you to about 30,000 feet, and I want you to kind of see a broad uh, view of what exactly is going on at Rift Valley Academy. AIM, Africa Inland Mission, is an organization that's been there for over 100 years. And they're specific. Unlike WGM, which is more global, Africa Inland Mission is specific to Africa and reaching Africans for Christ. And one of their motto mottos is, um, I just forgot it. Reaching, I'm sorry, reaching unreached people for Christ. I mentioned it earlier. Reaching unreached people for Christ. And you might think, well, that's really neat. But what does it mean to be unreached? And they've said that being unreached, in order for a people group to be unreached, it means that less than 3% of that people group or, or that area in which they live has any access to the word of God or somebody to speak it. All right. So I, I want you to kind of 
let that marinate in your mind for a minute. You have the ability in your seat right now, most of you probably have a smartphone. You have the ability, and if you have a specific app called the Bible app or whatever, you can access over a hundred different translations of a Bible in multiple different languages. Not only that, but you're sitting in a beautiful uh, building with people that have been schooled in the Word of God that are teaching you when, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesdays. You are completely immersed in the Word of God in many ways if you want it. But there are people in this world that have no access, if they want it or not, to the Word of God. And that's amazing to me. And so AIM, much like WGM, seeks to reach people that have zero access to the Word of God. Now, they are working in other areas that have had access, but they're wanting to push into these areas. Now, what sort of areas are these? These areas are very, very difficult to get to. All right? Some of them are closed off because of other religious reasons, Islam for one. All right? And so they're wanting to, and there are people much like you that Jesus is calling, they're impressing upon their hearts, and they're asking them, I want you to, to move to Chad in the middle of Africa in an Islamic country, and I want you to minister to these people. All right? And there are people much like you who are answering that call to go into these areas. But the same concern that my parents had when they went to Kenya is the same concern that they had. Where are we going to send our kids? Because if I go to Chad, one of the only schools that might be available is one of the local schools, which might be a madrasa, which is an Islamic school. And so what are they going to learn from? They're not going to learn from the Bible. They're going to want to learn from the Quran. Is that what you want your children to learn from? No. Well, we have another option. I could homeschool them. You know, we could take up most of our days and figure out, you know, the husband would do one thing, or, or maybe they'll teach science, and the, mo the mom would, would spend their afternoon teaching the kids. Uh, but that really hinders the ministry in which that they're going to be involved in. In other words, in order to be in, an, in a community like that and, and be effective, you're wanting to build relationships, you're wanting to have them over. You, you are completely immersing yourself in a culture, in an environment, in a language that you don't know, and you're trying to do that alongside of uh, of raising your kids and, and teaching them at the same time. And there are some that have chosen to do that, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it becomes very difficult. And it, begins to, it begins to wear. It begins to wear. And so many years ago, AIM started a school called, Afri or called Rift Valley Academy. Rift Valley Academy is situated about an hour's drive from Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, and it sits in, in, in a, a tribal group of the Kikuyu people, kind of a, a little bit of a remote area, but you can access the city from it. Um, and it's for missionary kids. It was designed for missionary kids so that missionaries that were sent into these difficult areas had a place, a safe place where they can send their children to learn under an American curriculum, okay, so that when they transition back to the United States or whatever their home country was, they could do it successfully, all right? And not only that, but they could excel in whatever God was calling their children to do, right? So when my brother and a excuse me, and I and my sisters came back to the States. We went right into college, and there we were just like everybody else as far as our educational uh, levels, all right? We, we could move into that and, and pursue what it is that God had for us socially. If you're someone who was raised in, in maybe you're homeschooled in that sort of an environment, let's say you can't, your parents came back or you graduated from a homeschool in the middle of Chad, in the middle of Africa, and you were enrolled into University of Florida. How do you feel like that transition socially would happen? Very, it would be extremely difficult. And so RVA seeks to help those transitions back and forth. And, and lastly, their number one goal is to reach people for Jesus. And so these missionary kids that are being brought into this school, much like myself, who didn't know Jesus at the time, are being asked, hey, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? We know what your parents are doing, and it's a beautiful thing what they're doing. But do you? Because you're not saved because of your parents. Amen? Jesus says, do you, do you know me? Do you know me? Many of you know this passage. It's in Acts chapter 10, or I'm sorry, Romans. Excuse me. I'm going to flip there real quick. 
In Romans chapter 10, it says this. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Amen? As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. That's a beautiful thing. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? All right, and here's where it is. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one who they have not heard? If they have never heard of the name of Jesus before, then how can they believe in him? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? For as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This morning, my challenge is to you is how beautiful are your feet? Now, some of you don't look down, you know. Ron, don't take off your shoes, please. I want to have beautiful feet. I want to have beautiful feet. And that means being obedient to what God is calling us to. And I want you to have beautiful feet. Because God is, just as much as he's sending us, he's sending you in many ways. He sent you a pastor to preach the good news to you. But there are many in this world who don't have the luxury that we have of somebody coming up on this, sto on this podium and opening God's word and speaking it and teaching it into your lives. And AIM seeks to reach the unreached people for Christ, and he is sending, and he is sending, and he is sending. And you, that's where you come in, because you are the sending. Amen? Because some, Jesus might not be speaking. There might be somebody in this room this, this evening that Jesus is touching your heart and is saying, you know what, I think I do want you to go to Chad. You think I'm joking, I'm not. Jesus uses ordinary people just like us, right? But he may not be. And he's sending you into this area, right? And, he, and he, just like Destiny has said, he has something specific for you to shine your light, boy. That's right. He wants you to shine. Let your light shine. And he's wanting you to shine to the community that you live in. But you also are a part of what God is doing in reaching unreached people for Christ. You can have a part in that. I hope that you believe that. You, you have sent a group of people to Israel, right? And I think I heard once, we hope that people are saved because of this trip. Amen? And then there are also, maybe there's somebody that they might come in contact with that they can shine their light to, and they say, well, why are you here? We're here to tell the story of Jesus Christ and where he walked along in this earth. Why? Because we want people to know Jesus. And you are a group that is sending, so you're a part. I want you to believe this, and I want you to understand this. You are a part of what Jesus is doing in reaching unreached people for Jesus Christ. Do you believe that this evening? I hope that our testimony and what we are speaking to you tonight gives you an encouragement that you are, you are part of a huge picture of what God is involved in. And he is. He's bringing people to know Jesus through people that are obedient and going into these areas to tell people about Jesus. So what does that mean for you and I? Destiny and I and our family are going to be traveling, as she said, in July to go to Africa to work as dorm parents at Rift Valley Academy. And we've signed up for two years, but we don't know. That's unending. We don't know how long God is going to call us there for. And we're excited. We're excited. To be. But we couldn't do it without you. We really couldn't. The boy sang a song. Someone is praying for me, right? Is that, what, is that how it goes? Someone's praying for me, and that's our number one desire. Because I, I, there's going to be a time when I am uh, really frustrated with some 11th grade girls. Are you with me? All right. We believe that as we engage the enemy, the enemy is fighting back. 
and so we covet your prayers. The number one thing that we desire is for someone to pray for us, for someone to pray for us. At the back, as you leave, we have a, we have a, a, a table back there, and some, there's some pictures, and we're going to be there after the service, and you can stop by, and you can see some pictures. You can talk to us if you have any specific questions. Um, but there's also a pledge form, and on that pledge form, if you take it, you can say, hey, I, I, I choose to pray for you daily. I, pr- I, pray, I choose to pray for you monthly or, or whatever it is that you desire, and we really want you, if you sign that, to really commit to doing that. You can even say, I want to pray for Gracie. You know, that's a difficult thing. You know, she didn't decide to do this. We're, we're taking her along, right? Elijah, he's excited. He has no idea what he's getting into, <laughs> to, but he's excited, right? Uh, you can say, I'm, I'm going to pray for Elijah. I'm going to pray for Gracie. I'm going to pray for Destiny. I'm going to pray for Brent. Whatever, whatever that looks like, you can pray for all of us as a family. We have a prayer card that you can take with you. So we cover your prayers. Secondly, we can't do it without our finances. And so AIM has asked us to raise $5,700 a month. That sounds like a lot of money, uh, and it is a lot of money. Um, and if you have any questions about what that looks like, I'd love to talk with you, but I don't need to go into all the details uh, up here. Uh, but we need monthly pledges, people that will come alongside of us and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you $20 a month. I'm going to give you $50 a month because that helps us engage and do what we need to do without worrying about all the other things uh, that are around us. And I know that this church and there are people within this church that have supported my parents. And I want to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for the many years. You have no idea. You, you don't know what, what that goes to, but it's, it's a blessing. And I pray that anybody who's praying and, and and giving financially that God would bless you beyond what you can even ask or imagine because you're a part of what God is doing in reaching the unreached people for Christ. That's our story, and that's what Jesus is speaking to our heart, and that's our conviction uh, that we've had for much time. And you can see how God has has brought me in in, in my own life and and destiny in her own life and, and brought us together um, and is now is going to take us and use us in amazing ways. And um, we're grateful and we're humbled yeah. with God speaking into our hearts and giving us the opportunity uh, to do this. And so we ask that you would come beside us, that you would be a part of our team uh, in reaching the unreached people for Christ. May God bless you. Let me pray for you, and then I'll turn it over to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. Tonight, we love you. With the bottom of our hearts, we love you. We're grateful for how you work and how you intervene in our lives and how you, 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 you change different stories and how you, you challenge our lives. And um, God, there might be somebody in this room tonight that you're speaking to in, in whatever capacity that may be. Maybe they don't know you as their personal Savior. Maybe they haven't been asked by someone else, hey, do you know Jesus? Does he live in your heart? Does, has his spirit come into you and then dwelt within you and changed you? to his image. I pray, Jesus, if there is somebody here who doesn't know you, that, Father, you would speak into their lives. And I know that there are many elders and pastors and people that can come alongside of them and pray for them here today. I pray, Jesus, that as you minister to this church and those that are not here, and and we think of Pastor Will, who's in Israel, and and, and those that are with him, and God, I pray protection and and grace over them that they would learn as much as they can and and be filled with your spirit, and uh, Father, come back excited to share all the things that you are doing in their lives. I pray a blessing over this church that you would continue to use it in this kingdom to be a light in a dark world. As Pastor Hoy had so well spoke this morning, allow us to shine. Give us courage to shine. Give us courage to see ourselves through your eyes, that you you see us as important. We're not just just somebody. We, we, We are your children, and you love us dearly, and you want us to be used by you. And so may we humble ourselves and completely and utterly surrender ourselves to you in order to be used by you, whatever that looks like, that we might have beautiful feet in telling people about Jesus and and just maybe our neighbor, maybe the person that we work with. Father, bless this church. Thank you for this opportunity, Father. May you be glorified, for it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
want to sing a, a verse of invitation if you're here and uh, you'd like to come and pray. As Brent said, if there's some here that have never trusted Christ, we'd like to invite you to come. Uh, if the Lord's spoken to your heart about uh, some of the things they shared and the calling that God yes, puts sir. on people's lives, we want to give you opportunities. So as we sing, if you need to pray for any reason, we'd like to open the altars. Sing with us. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before. for them. I thought as they spoke, uh, yeah, if you don't mind getting them, Tom, and everyone that will, will Robbie, you and your family come too, and we just like to gather around all of you and pray. Uh, how proud Terry must be looking down oh, from yes. heaven. Oh, yes. And uh, so grateful. And I, I tell you, man, that resonates. Uh, maybe it resonates a little bit more because they are family yes. uh, to say, you know what, God, they're saying anywhere, any place, any time, I'm willing to go. And so uh, I'd like for us to do that as they come. And everyone that will, let's just gather around them and let's pray for them. Yes. And then uh, we'll, we'll be dismissed tonight. So we're, we're grateful. Everyone that will, would you just gather around?